Hello and welcome to the Hoop Collective Podcast. We talk about the NBA, which we're doing on Sunday evening. Joining us from New York City, just before he's headed to Boston for a Bucks uh, celtics uh, showdown on Monday, is Tim Bonteps. Hello, everybody. Joining us from Dallas, just back from the... Uh, Phoenix Suns victory over the Dallas Mavericks, where I think one of the biggest moments of the NBA season happened when uh, Kevin Durant scored 29,000 points. His 29,000 <laughs> point uh, is Bam McMahon. Howdy, partners, inside dorky uh, journalist thing going on there. Yeah. twenty nine. I mean, you know, it's cool it's a, to score 29,000. But yeah, you know. he's, he's, he's well on his way to 30K. I think he... Uh, you know, if he stays healthy, hopefully he's there by the All Star break. It, it was a um, it was a really good win for the Suns. Yeah, um, really good. And uh, back, for some back. reason, the headline was that the Durant scored twenty nine thousand points. I was just mystified. All right, um, this afternoon on a Sunday afternoon, when the World Series is going on, and it's uh, there's the Washington Commanders are winning on hail marys, and Cleveland Browns are upsetting the Baltimore Ravens. Oh. Wow, all that. My phone that. was getting lit up. And I mean, like people that I don't hear from maybe once every three or four months. I mean, I got probably seven texts within about a 30 minute span. And it was not about any of those things. It was about the unveiling of the Dwayne Wade statue in Miami on Sunday evening. Um, you know, a lot of people work very hard on this. You know, it's, I'm sure it's very difficult. Uh, I'm sure there's a big, long process. Um, Dwayne Wade said he was involved in it a lot. I know. Does he own a mirror? I know he's got <laughs> a lot of money. But... I mean, I, you know, I, I don't want to be flippant. Uh, Listen, how could you not be? It is not, it doesn't resemble him. It's, it's rough, man. It, it, it's rough. You know what they should have done? Whoever made this, <laughs> the Brian Wendy Windhorst bobblehead doll, Windhurst. Uh, <laughs> I'm this guy, because look at this. Look at this. Look at this. And can I tell you something? Can I tell you that like nine or 10 months out, I saw what the what it was going to look like? They sent it to me. Like, which I suppose I could have been like, no, no, no. I can't. I mean, I'm not saying I had approval, but like I saw it like, I want to say at least nine months out, I saw it. Mm -hmm. I saw what it would look like. I saw the mold. How far out do you get to see? I don't know the answer. Um, but I know at some point, somebody had to see it and be like, what are we going to do here? Yeah. You know, there was some meeting at some point, right? Where they were like, and somebody gave the green light, oh, go ahead and ship it out here. I, I, I don't know, man. I, you know, obviously, many people have made the joke on social media about the Christian, Cristiano Ronaldo uh, bust that was in an airport in Portugal. They had to replace that one. But that was just like a bust. That was a bust in an airport. That wasn't like. Well, there have giant... been some Hall of Fame busts. You know, there, I, I can't remember the names off the top of my head, but, you know, you've seen some like pro football Hall of Fame busts. They're just like, dude, come on. Like, it, that's got to be done again. I don't. I don't know. I don't know what. I don't know what's going to be done. I, maybe they'll just. I don't know. Literally, it's the only thing people can say. Um, seeing it, it's. If you haven't seen it yet, you're going to see it. There's no way you're not going to see it. Uh, you know, the thing about it is, is that the rest of the statue is spectacular. It's like his uniform. His uniform looks great. Like it looks realistic. It's just. Uh, Bontemps isn't saying anything. I don't know. He doesn't want to be. He doesn't want to be part of this. He wants this, to keep uh, his some No, I mean, I, I, uh, I just was answering a couple texts from uh, somebody. But no, look, I mean, I showed K Bon the picture. I said, "You got to see this." K Bon, who is an artist, and she looked at it and said, "That's supposed to be Dwayne Wade, the guy who's married to Gabrielle Union." I said, "Yes." <laughs> she goes, "That doesn't look like him." I said, "Yes, that is all. That's all correct." <laughs> I mean, look. We saw it with, I mean, the funny thing was Dwayne Wade said this was in the same place as the Kobe statue, which obviously came out with a couple of mistakes on the podium. So uh, not an ideal, not an ideal couple of things there, but see, I guess the most important thing is Dwayne Wade seemed happy. So the Kobe statue you know, had like, you know, some clerical errors on it. The, the actual 
bust, you know, the face was yeah. excellent. And Dwayne Wade well, seemed happy. I guess that's all that really matters. You know so what? That's if true. He's happy, then great. Plenty what do we think? Look at it. What do we think? Are they? Is this statue going to go into repair the short term? Or are they going to stick with it? What do we think? I don't. I don't. I doubt it. I suspect that's what it's going to be. I don't know. I think that. Uh, I don't think they can do it right away. I think like little off season, little little maybe a summer sneak job type of thing. They, they <laughs> the have... sneak job. It's a giant statue. You can't just. You can't just paste on a new face. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe um, they could just like photocopy or like. <laughs> Put a picture of them on top of it. I don't know. You need some AI. I don't know. Um, oh, Alan Iverson's statue was only about this tall. It was a wee little fella. <laughs> That's true. It was and too nobody small. too small. And everybody knew that nobody said it didn't look like him, though. Um also true. Anyway, um, I don't know if you guys heard, but the Lakers are undefeated. <laughs> oh, 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 look out. Look uh, out. Heck of a start for the Lakers. No, that's not the headline. The headline is DeMontis Sabonis is no longer undefeated against Anthony Davis. That, that's we're true. The biggest shocks of the NBA season. Now, it wasn't exactly – the AD obviously is off to a hell of a start. They did – the Lakers won that game despite him being minus 22. Um, but, <laughs> hey, 3-0 Lakers and AD is averaging what – like 36 right now. He scored over 30 in all three games. I don't care what his plus minus was in that game on Saturday, because to me, the whole story, the first week of the season for them, Anthony Davis is having 34 points, 11 rebounds on 57% shooting from the field. If he is going to play in that kind of ballpark going forward, we're talking about the Lakers in a much different light than we have been the last couple of years. Cause when AD is playing like this, when he's a, certified top 10 player in the league. The Lakers are a team that you have to reckon with in the league. And the biggest question really throughout Anthony Davis's career has been an inability to play like this on a consistent basis. And I'll give JJ Redick a lot of credit from the moment he's gotten into this job. The thing he's talked about is running stuff through Anthony Davis, making Anthony Davis a focal point, doing everything he can to optimize him. It's only three games. There's a long way to go, but he has looked phenomenal. And if he can continue to play like this, the Lakers are going to be a dangerous team in the West. Yeah. And if LeBron still at the age of almost 40 is capable of taking games over like he did in the fourth quarter last night. That, that start of the fourth quarter like, was unbelievable. Like 16, 6, and 6 in the fourth quarter and didn't miss a shot. Didn't miss a shot. <laughs> Don't tell Roy he scored 12 though. or 14 in a row. You guys really saw good. that, right? <laughs> swing, swing. Yes. That, yeah, you, know what, you know what that reminded me of? Sometimes when Bon Temp just gets yipping and yapping and you're standing there like swing, swing, MF or <laughs> <Yeah. fight back. laughs> if you didn't see it in the it was a timeout in the fourth quarter. Um the Lakers were in the middle of a comeback. LeBron was red hot. Um I think he made his first six shots of the fourth, I think was the number. All six, um, yeah. But uh so there's a timeout. The Suns call or the uh Kings call timeout and um I don't, I don't, I wasn't watching it live, so I didn't, I don't know the play, but, but Rui must have taken a shot well, when LeBron thought he was open. <laughs> LeBron was like, uh, they were going to break, and you could hear LeBron in the huddle uh, telling Rui, like, man, listen, I'm, I made 10 in a row. Swing, swing, <laughs> you know, get it over to me. <laughs> heat, let me heat check. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's just well, look, a These guys LeBron's are going to go, these guys, yeah, these guys are going to go like Anthony Davis goes, though. That, like, and if he can, consistently be healthy and play at this kind of way, like they will be a dangerous team. But obviously he and LeBron have to stay healthy. He's got to play like this for a long stretch, but this has been a really encouraging first three games for them. Right. So yeah. I, I would say uh, you mentioned it when JJ Redick uh, took over um, the Lakers, he, he mentioned a couple of things right off the bat. Um, and one of the things that I respect, not just about new coaches, but just a, about any coach, when they have a plan and then stick to it, sometimes you sometimes you shouldn't stick to a plan because it doesn't work and you got to pivot. But I respect when a coach gets a job and says, um, "This is what we're going to do," and then he comes out and earnestly tries to do it. Now, look, there could be an injury, there could be a trade, something could help happen um, where you can't stick to it. But JJ said the day he got the job, we're going to play through Anthony Davis. And two years ago, LeBron was taking on average five more shots a game 
than Anthony Davis was, which wasn't necessarily a problem. LeBron was almost leading the league in scoring two years ago. Um, but it was an indication that they weren't playing through Anthony Davis. They were playing through hell. They were playing through Austin Reeves at times more than Anthony Davis. Uh, and then last year, AD had his best year, in my opinion, as a Laker, at, when you combine the way he played at both ends of the court. And that's kind of part of this story. Part of this story is it is that Anthony Davis is in better physical condition. He is just in better physical condition than he was earlier in his career. Um, and he's he's going through a run of health. So knock on wood and hope that continues. But like this is one of the things that helped him throughout last season. Um, and then when he got to Team USA this last summer, he was in of the big men, especially. He mm -hmm. was in clearly the best condition uh, out of any of the bigs who were in camp. Who were and, the bigs? Um, Bam Adebayo. Bam Adebayo. Joel not that Bam Adebayo was out of shape. <laughs> um, and Joel Embiid. Uh, Joel Embiid, who was out of shape. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my point. I, my point is, he looked just great, and he was terrific. I, I talked to his trainer um, during the the run up games, and he talked about how hard he'd been working in the off season to get ready for Team USA, and that conditioning has continued through and i know we're only, just only three games obviously all this is with the caveat that we are still in october he's averaging 19 shots that's more um uh shots than he's averaged ever as a laker um and it's more than lebron and for the first time ever okay over three games but right um and i think most importantly his aggression level i mean this is one thing with ad what drives people crazy is his lack of aggression. Now, there's no way he's going to continue averaging 15 free throws a game. Right. But that is what he is averaging. He has taken 45 free throws in the first three games. Okay, that's not going to that's not going to keep up. And and almost 19 field goal attempts a game. That's what I'm saying. Not, the, the most he's he's averaged as a Laker. So plus he's getting to the, you know, he's getting, you know, roughly seven and a half shooting right. fouls, eight shooting fouls a game. Just so massive means, usage. Right. And so look, 34 points a game, which is what he's averaging. I can't see that holding up 15 free right. throws a game. I can't see that holding up, but I could see him holding up 19 shots a game. And I could see him holding up being the Lakers primary offensive option. They're playing through him. At least one A. I mean, like LeBron's not just going to be a complimentary player, but so if if you have him doing that and playing his butt off on the defensive end, then you've got a first team All NBA type of player. Well, and that's and that's always been the thing with him, right? Like this is always the kind of guy that's been in there, and at times we've seen it. But Anthony Davis is the thing with him has always been: can he consistently play at this kind of level? Because he's got MVP talent. And if he plays like this all year again, like the Lakers are going to be a force to be reckoned with. But he's got to play like this for 82 games. He's got to stay healthy. LeBron has to stay healthy. Like, obviously, LeBron's the oldest player in the league. I mean, he didn't look like it at the start of that fourth quarter the other night. But when those two guys or are playing like this, matter. right. But like when those two guys are playing like this, this is the formula for them to be a dangerous team. And we'll see how it plays out over time. But this was a dream start. Yes, all the games at home, but playing three playoff caliber teams in the West and delivering three huge games. The other thing, the other thing JJ brought up right when he got hired was the possession game. He felt that the Lakers were going to have to do much better in the possession game. Um, and they were 29th in offensive rebounding percentage last year. And, I know I feel like a broken record here, three games. Um, but I think they're like seventh or eighth. And, you know, there's games happening as we're doing this. So, you know, and it's super high early. So if you wake up and check me on that, it may not still be there by morning. But just know that their offensive uh, rebounding has dramatically increased from 29th to one of the best in the first week of the season. Obviously, a key thing that he's doing, specifically Rui, H Rui Hachimura, they have, there's no doubt that JJ Redick and his coaching staff have yelled in Rui's ear or spoken it or whatever they got to do to get Rui to crash the offensive glass because he's been a much bigger factor on the offensive glass these first three games than he's ever been as a Laker. Um, other thing is the turnovers are down. The Lakers were bottom half of the league in turnover percentage last year. 
improved early going, you know, you could have one bad night and that could flip, but the possession game is going in the favor of the Lakers. And so, you know, if you're looking for ways that the Lakers are going to improve, how do you get from ninth place to sixth place when you've got the same roster? You've got to get more out of what you have, right? So yep. the way that JJ is doing this <clears throat> is he is trying to be more efficient in the game plan, being more Anthony Davis. He thinks that there's more there for him to give. And I think everybody's agreed with that throughout his career. And then, you know, look at things that you do with your style of play that can help you tighten the gaps. And he's he's doing it with with focusing on being more efficient with possession. So we'll see. All of this, we could look, you know, forget about December. We could look back in 10 days because they're going on a five-game road trip and they could get kicked in the teeth. But I respect it, again, that they're clearly playing to this game plan. And, you know, if they do what they did last night, which is they need LeBron to be great in the fourth quarter, one out of every three games, that's doable. LeBron can do that. We know he can still do that. He was, I think he scored 16 in the fourth and they were came from behind. So um, I can only imagine how much Lakers stuff is going to be on our NBA programming that's 24 hours. Um, but they have a big uh, game already uh, getting a rematch. They beat the Suns second game of the season. Um, uh, you saw the Suns Saturday night beat the Dallas Mavericks uh, McMahon in Phoenix. Um, so Monday night, the Lakers are in Phoenix to start of the five game road trip. Um what do you think we're going to see there? We've already the Lakers and Suns have played each other three times in the last three weeks, twice in the preseason. So it's not many surprises. But um, what do you think of the Suns? Uh, pretty impressed. Thought it was a nice win for them. Nice early season win uh, on a back to back, shorthanded with Grayson Allen out, uh, new daddy duty, and Bradley Beal taking the night off with a, a sore elbow. Um, Suns finished strong. Something you did not see very often last year. I think Tyus Jones definitely has a, a major influence on that. And, you know, this kid, Ryan Dunn, I think has a chance to be a really, really good role player. Got the start, got the assignment on Luca. Not going to say he shut him down. Luca got 40, but uh, he didn't dominate the game. You know, it, it, we've, I've seen last year at Christmas, Luca go for 50 and 15 in that building. Um, you know, at least made him one dimensional as a, as a scorer. And, you know, Katie was talking about, hey, the 5,019 minutes, he said, basically, I'll take that. You know, I'd rather a kid be too physical than have to amp him up the other way. So, and then, you know, Katie's KD. Uh, he had kind of a typical KD night. Booker was decent offensively, but, you know, they, they looked like a, a team that uh, will at least be a tough out in the West. Yeah, Tyus Jones has uh, 19 assists and two turnovers over the first three games combined. I mean, that's that's what he does. I mean, he's been one right. of the assisted turnover leaders in the league for the last few years. Um, by the way, he came over to the NBA Today set um, a couple of days ago when he was in L.A. after their season opening went over the Clippers. And he had, you can find it, I'm sure, on social, but he had one of the best uh, segments, I think, that I've ever seen done with a player um at nba today he he was with tim legler legler had the ipad and they were breaking down film on the giant led screen and they were you know they were like freezing plays um where like tyus was getting the ball it was one time for example they did this on like three or four plays but all of them were really good where tyus had the ball in transition and they froze the image and legler was saying well what, what are you looking at here you know you know uh when this fast break, what are you trying to do? And Tyus is like, well, I'm watching to see if I can get a third man to join the um, the fast break. And if we go three on one, and so I go to the certain lane and those guys fill the other lanes, I'm looking to see where Booker's hips are relative to the guy who was defending him. Um, he's like, he had him turn, so he knew he was going to be able to outrun the guy. And he's like, okay, so I'm looking to go to Booker and I'm thinking, do I throw a bounce pass? Do I throw a lob over the top? It was just a terrific segment, by the way. And even if you don't go back and watch it, it's an indication of how Tyus thinks the game. And, and they did this on three or four possessions where he was looking. Um, they also did a defensive possession where he actually gambled and got a steal. Um, and he talked about why he was feeling comfortable to gamble and why he uh, judged it. So a really good segment, but illustrated when you put a guy out there like Tyus Jones, who is going to, you know, 
think his way through. I mean, this is one of the things that they missed. They they lose Chris Paul last year. Chris Paul is one of the great thinkers in the history of the position. I'm not saying Tyus Jones is Chris Paul, but in terms of good decision making, Tyus Jones is in the same league. And so obviously I mean, that makes a difference. Filling a need for a minimum salary, it was it was just a massive sign in for them. Yeah, two years ago, Chris Paul made thirty million. So yeah, him making three million or whatever it is, two and a half, is uh, certainly an efficient usage of it. By the way, two other guys I should mention: Nurkic was a, a physical beast last night, the Bosnian beast. He, he was bullying guys inside, uh, and then Royce O'Neal. Uh, you know, role players are going to really matter for the Suns, uh, especially role players who can guard a little bit. And you know, he he. he He's a physical guy too. He had one sequence though, into the third quarter, makes a tough layup with four seconds left, sprints the floor, and swats uh, Jaden Hardy's layup attempt from behind. And you know, Bud mentioned, "Hey, that's a play that uh, we're going to make sure we show in film session. The guys are really going to enjoy." Yeah, I ran into Royce at a restaurant in L.A. the other day. Um, always good to see Royce. He was suffering from, I think he had to get stitches in his lip because he got bashed in the face in the season opener. Um, but you know, Royce and I have a kinship because it was his trade that made me uh, wonder what was going on in Utah. That's true. <laughs> well, look at it, it, the Nurk thing is huge for Phoenix. Like they need him to be good and effective for, for them. Like if he's given them productive minutes at center, you know, Bud has talked about trying to get him to become more of a three point shooter. He obviously did that with Brooke Lopez, who had, I think more of a consistent track record as a shooter, but if they can get a consistent 28 to 30 minutes of solid play from Nurkic every night, that's really going to matter to them a lot. It sort of goes back to your point about the Lakers when you made it about JJ and how can you improve with basically the same team? Obviously they've gone out and added some different role players. You know, they, they draft Ryan Dunn, they draft, you know, they sign Mason Plumley, they get Tyus Jones and Monty Morris, but a lot of this is going to be, how do you get the core of that team to play better than it did last year? If Bud can get more out of use of Nurkic and have these guys shoot more threes, those are two pretty clear ways for these guys to improve. And, you know, we'll see how the rest of the, the week goes or how the rest of the, you know, the month goes as we get started. But I, I thought that was a particularly big game for the Suns on Saturday, playing Dallas on the second night of a back-to-back. They wheezed through the opener against the Clippers, probably should have lost the game, didn't get smacked by the Lakers on Friday playing a Dallas team that looked great in its first game. No Bradley Beal. I thought that was a pretty significant win, even though it's the first weekend of the season for Phoenix. And we'll see if they can build on it in this game against the Lakers on Monday night. Grayson Allen expected back for that game. Bradley Beal questionable with that elbow soreness. Speaking of Brooke Lopez, as you did a moment to go, Bon Temps, they're in New York City here on Sunday night. The Brooklyn Nets beat the Bucs by 13 points. Um, The Bucs are now one of two. And shortly here, getting on a plane to Boston, where you'll see them on the second night of a back-to-back. The Celtics were off. Yeah, I don't Actually, like they've been off the last. Two. Well, I wouldn't have liked the Nets odds on Sunday night, so we'll see. You never know in the NBA. But well, no, the Nets are one to zero since um, getting into it with fans in the back hallway at <laughs> uh, in Orlando on Friday night. If you didn't see that, um, they you know Orlando beat them. They're coming off the court. And a, uh, a fan, you know, there's uh, all these arenas now have these areas where fans can sort of interact with players at these underground clubs. Um, the Nets were walking off and uh, somebody called uh, Ben Simmons trash. I uh, literally trash talked him. And mm-hmm. um, Dennis Schroeder, like, stepped to him, like said, <laughs> my favorite part was Schroeder comes back and was like, who's talking, who's trash talking Ben? And the one kid's like that guy right over there who <laughs> sold him right out <laughs> uh, of Paolo Bancaro fans. Like, Hey man, I don't, I want to see Paolo. Don't get me thrown out of here. Um, mm-hmm. So want to know since then, and Cam Thomas is off to a good start. He's got a couple of 30 point games already, but beside that uh, bond temps, the bucks one and two lost to Chicago which is not exactly a team that we're expecting to be a powerhouse this year. Uh, now lose to Brooklyn. Those are two wins. If you're in the Eastern conference, you know, you need to win those games because you're going to have nights where you play Boston, the second night of a back to back, uh, where you're going to take it in the teeth in all likelihood. This is not the greatest start for the bucks. Well, yeah, look, they obviously played great in Philly on Wednesday. No Joel Embiid, no Paul George. They I did mean, what they yeah, should. That's no, but I, asterisk there. Listen, yeah. they did yeah. they did what they should have, and they smacked around the Sixers and won by 30. Game wasn't competitive. That's what you should do. Mm-hmm. Then 
They play Chicago on Friday, and I'm just going to read a couple stats. Kobe White, 35 points, 12 for 20 from the field, 7 for 13 from three. Zach Levine, 25 points, 9 for 15 from the field. Josh Giddy, 17 points, 6 for 10 from the field, 9 assists, 1 turnover. I'm going to read a couple more stats. Sunday night, playing the Nets. Cam Thomas, 32 points, 10 for 21 shooting, 10 for 11 at the line. Dennis Schroeder, 29 points, plus 27. Oh, boy. 8 for 15 from the field, 5 for 8 from 3, 8 for 8 from the line, 6 assists, 2 turnovers. What do those guys all have in common? They're all guards who can get in the lane and are other than, I mean, Giddy's not super quick, but he's good at getting in the lane. The other four guys are all quick guards, right? Go back to the summer. We talked about with the Bucs, they had a glaring lack of athleticism across the roster. And you look at these first couple games, it is very concerning to play two teams that they should be smacking in the Bucs or in the Bulls and the Nets. And you're seeing all these quick guards going off. Like obviously, it's only one week, very early. We'll see what happens, but but it's not pretty... one week. It, it, it's a season in one week. Yes, you know, that would like this is the same. The, they lost arguably the best guard defender in the league, and for all of, of Dame's talents offensively, going back a year to when they traded you Holiday. To be clear, not this season, right, right? And for all of Dame's, you know, like he's a, a you know one of the best offensive guards of this generation. He's a problem defensively. Like you have to try to hide him and protect him, and it's hard to do. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously you're not going to be overreacting to the first week, like we said. But what you're describing, Bon Temps, is not something that's a easy fix. That challenge is going to be there, and so you know, especially the about, when they don't have a lot of trade assets to do anything with. Right, and you know, the thing about it is, is that the, just the margin for error, you know. The margin for error in the NBA right now is tight, but you know, the margin for error in the East is tight. I mean, the difference in the East between, you know, three and four and three and five is is going to be important. And, you know, they're going to be challenged with this. Um, I don't know. I I I'm I, I feel like the more we talk about it, the more likely the Bucks pull off a miracle uh bounce back because that's just that's the nature of the NBA. That'd be the hoop collective, you know, jinx or whatever you want to call it. But boy, that's well, and they, well, and even like Chris Middleton obviously is out. And when they have Chris, Dave, and Giannis out there, they feel like with Brooke Lopez, they feel like they're as good as anybody in the league. And their numbers last year with those guys were really good. But Chris Middleton's also not solving this defense problem. Mm-hmm. Like he's still a, an excellent offensive player. And we saw in the playoffs going up against Indiana, he made a ton of big plays for them in that series, even though they lost. But this, this is going to be a concern all year. And, you know, like Gary Trent is on there, is there on a one-year minimum, and he was going to be, he's going to be tasked with guarding a lot of these guys. And like, he's, he's got to be able to do it if they're going to have a chance. And so far it's not, it's not been off to the best start. Now, again, it's, it's a week. It's only three games. I don't think should be saying the sky's falling necessarily, but like with another team, I think we're about to talk about that's off to a rough start. These are some things that we were looking at in the summer saying this could be a problem. And through the first couple games, it's a problem. And it will be very interesting to see how they bounce back in Boston um, against a Celtics team that had to do a bit of a hootie act of its own to escape from with a win in Detroit on Saturday night, but managed to ultimately. But but the Bucs were also a, a franchise that there's kind of a fragile feeling around it. Right. I mean, so like I would say if you Look at all the teams that we think are potential contenders. The Bucks can least afford to get off to a slow start. Well, the By team the way, in Philly is maybe in the same boat, and they're not off to the greatest of starts. So they also were able to escape with a win today that they desperately needed in Indiana. In a very wild game. Um, by the way, the Celtics nine and a half point favorites right now at ESPN Bet. So I don't give gambling advice, but that seems a little low. Well, again, I I didn't think the Celtics are going to struggle to beat Detroit, and they were down in the final few minutes and had to pull off a pretty furious comeback to pull that one out. So, and Detroit was playing, I believe, on the second night of a back to back themselves. So they were after playing. They were, yeah, uh, they, the, they, now they three ran and the Cavs. juggernaut Cavs on Friday That's night. That's right. 
who are tied atop the Eastern Conference, the Celtics and the Cleveland Cavaliers. And it's now time for Cavs Corner with Brian Windhorst. The Cavs, by the way, have won. Uh, I mean, they've hey, they've run the murderer's row of Toronto, Detroit, and Washington out of the gate. Cavs so, Corner. Cavs Corner. Uh, Listen, just, we're just not, you know, we're, let it be known that that is uh, that should be uh, factored in here. But big um, game in MSG Monday night. We talked about it. The seven game stretch. Cavs Knicks. Big game. Low key. Uh, low key. Uh, big early game. Um, First time in Cavs history, they've won the first three games of a season by ten or ten or more points. I think they've had they had LeBron for like ten mm-hmm. or eleven years, so they had some starts of the season. But um, I guess when LeBron reminder, they had tougher Knicks, games. Reminder: Knicks, Lakers, Magic, Bucks twice, Pelicans, Warriors. Next seven games for the Cavs. Very very curious to see how these seven games go. Will tell us a lot about them. By the way, how about this for uh, trivia? Um, Jared Ooh, Allen was t- Jared Allen was 10 of 10 was uh 10 of 10 from the field on, um, on, uh, on Saturday. Uh, it's got 23 points, 10 of 10. It's the third time he's gone 10 of 10 for better or better in a game mm-hmm. in his career. Um, how, where does that rank all time? Career games in the shot clock era of going at least 10 for 10. I'm going to guess first. Go ahead. It ranks second. <laughs> to Will? Jokic, Jokic has done it three times. Dwight Howard's done it three times. Jared Allen's done it three times. The person who's done it more than three times, only one, has done it eight times. You want to guess? Wilt. Wilt is correct. Well, I mean, yeah. well, you said the shot clock era, so I wasn't assuming Wilt, but yeah, that's yeah. uh Yeah, I don't know. I Wilt, don't have Wilt. George Mike in stats. Hey, is Bob Pettit. What's Bob Pettit? Jackson, go look up how many times Bob Pettit. <laughs> Bob Pettit shot like 38% from the floor for his career. <laughs> oh I'm sorry, back then they just chucked, man. Yeah, I know. Some of those uh games, it was it was rough. Like there um, was no effective field goal percentage. <laughs> no. That's right. No. Um, all right. So the team that Bon Temps mentioned, the team is struggling coming out of the gate. Now, let me just say their next two games are at Toronto and at Brooklyn, although we probably shouldn't take Brooklyn for, for granted. Uh, the Denver Nuggets have lost their first two games um, and have had them look sort of similar, um, specifically with their issues on the bench, which is something we talked about um all the way through the off season uh, in the, in the season opening game against Oklahoma city, their starters actually outscored had a plus positive plus minus, And then the thunder bench just ev- ev- eviscerated them. And in this game, they lost on Saturday to the Clippers. Um, their bench shot three of 18 uh, and the Clippers were able to take advantage of that. And um, they got a, a historically great, not historically, but, personally historically great game from Norman Powell who had 37 points, including 22 in the fourth. Um, just, you know, totally ripping them before they go on a three game road trip to the East. Uh, Bon Temps, um, their, their big things as we've talked about are the bench play and the three point shooting. And with the other slow understanding that they need Jamal Murray to be very good. And they haven't gotten those three things aligned as of yet in this early season. Yeah, I mean, again, this is sort of like the Bucks conversation, where the things that, you know, as you just went through, the things we were concerned about with the, the the Nuggets through a couple games at least, and again, it's only a couple games, but the things we were concerned about have been a problem. They, outside of Nikola Jokic, through the first two games of the season, they are a combined 13 for 58 from three. That is sub 20, that's around 25%. 15 for 60 is 25 percent somewhere right in that ballpark obviously not great russell westbrook through the first two games oh boy he is a he is two for 18 from the field he is one for nine from three which means he's also one for nine from two not great he has he does have seven assists only two turnovers but again russ has come in and is being aggressive russ like we knew he would be and so far, the results have not been great. And then, and, no, no. He is minus 37 in 40 minutes. The results yes, I was, I was, I, I, I know the results have, I was obviously understating the results. You were the results being polite, been, but like, let's uh, just, yes. let's be 
let's just be blunt here. Like it's two games, maybe he figures it out, but the concerns about how Russ fits there. <laughs> oh, well, they, li- well listen, they got they got boat raced by the Thunder on Thursday at home in their home opener. All right, I, I, and then they play the Clippers on Saturday, who the Clippers who can't really score outside of James Harden are, are going to be sort of a Norm, difficult Norm team. Norm Powell, to, sir. Well, Norm Powell took off in this game, but my point yeah. is they're a team that's going to be difficult. They're going to be a difficult team to play between Ty Lu and the amount of versatile defenders they've got. Like they're not going to be a fun matchup on a nightly basis. We saw them give the Suns trouble in their first game. But the Nuggets had a 41-point game from Nikola Jokic where he went 7 for 12 from 3. And they were trying to pull out a game and ultimately didn't mm. against a Clipper at team home. that might at home against a Clipper team that might not make the play in. Like right. this is not like they're a team that's going to be fighting to be in the top 10 in the West. So again, very early, there were at least some signs from Jamal Murray. I mm. thought the one good thing from that game against the Clippers, I watched a bunch of it, was seeing the Murray Jokic pick and roll get going in the second half. They were getting a lot of good looks out of it. Murray ends up with 22 and five, like perfectly solid game from him. Looked a lot more like himself, which is a good sign. But Michael Porter Jr. can't hit a shot. It's They're not shooting threes. I mean, it's been, you're checking a lot of things that don't look great early. And, you know, we'll see where things sit in a few weeks. But like Milwaukee, a couple things that we were concerned about are immediately looking problematic in Denver. Well, and the other thing is losing KCP wasn't just about KCP in the starting lineup. It was about a thin bench getting thinner because now you've got Christian Brown gone from the bench and in the starting lineup, and they're relying on Russ, Dario Saric, who looks pretty old right now, and you know a lot of young, unproven guys. Well, and by, and by the way, how about Michael Malone after the fir- after that Thunder game just? Openly bringing up the KCP KCP thing again, I thought that was an interesting little wrinkle. Well, it's not a way to quiet the uh, the the noise about the coach and the front office not being on the same page. That's for sure. If they, if that's your goal is to pretend like that stuff came from outer space, and <laughs> I would say bringing it up right after you get spanked in the opener is probably not the way to go about it. Well, and also Nicole Jokic just sat up there and said, "Yeah, look, we're a streaky shooting team." Outside of Michael Porter and maybe Jamal, like we got a bunch of streaky shooters, which again, doesn't sound like much of a quote, but Jokic never says anything. So I thought both of those comments in tandem were a pretty interesting game or pretty interesting things to say after that opening game against the Thunder. Those seven threes that Jokic made were career high. So I mean, if he's going to shoot more threes, fine, but I don't think you're going to count on him to be, be doing that on a regular basis. Um, uh, but anyway, Friday, uh, Nuggets at Wolves, ESPN game. So um, Julius Randle's had a couple, but after a, a rocky opener, a couple of you know big stat lines. Well, the Wolves are trying to develop a, a style of play, and they're early on in that style. But what it looks like they want to do, um, they want Ant to take a lot of shots and a lot of threes. Ants uh, threes are up. Their isolation just in general. <laughs> Ants okay with that. <laughs> um, they want all their actually, threes to be up. Yeah, they're they're taking a lot more threes. Well, not a lot more, but they're taking more threes, which is something you know. Swap Carl Towns out for Divincenzo might be a wash there in terms of amount, but they want they want to get him up, and they're playing a little bit more isolation, which also favors Ant. But their style of play that it looks like they want to try to get to. Now we'll see if they can. Um, they want to sort of let Ant be the guy who finishes. And Ant, I think, is what he's been trying to do is get some other guys going early in the game, which is, you know, historically a historic thing that, you know, mm-hmm. great scorers do, try to get some other guys going early, and then they take the controls late. I think Ant is still learning how to do that. But that was one of the things that I think happened in the first game, that the second game, the first game, he didn't focus on getting Randall going early, and the second game he did. And I think yeah. that's the way they want to play. We'll see how it goes by Friday. But um, by the way, be... I will be I'll be in the building for that game on Friday. I'm oh. going up there with the uh, with the Mavs on Tuesday. It's back to back for the Mavs, but I'll be there. And then I'm going to 
spend spend uh, a few days up there in Minnesota. So I'll be in the building for some Wolves Nuggets. I up. am very excited that I will be uh, able to watch that game because it's on ESPN. <laughs> What if I was it's not a that. national exclusive. I, I thought you were going to say. I thought you were going to say you wanted Uh-oh. to Facetime you during the game. Uh oh. Hope I hope it's a national exclusive. Mm. Otherwise, it'll be on ESPN. And it'll all be black. How? Down. Why are you ruining my flow? No, it's. I'm sure it's a national exclusive. I, uh, I mean, we'll see. Maybe. No, I can always watch. I can always watch uh, the Wolves on ESPN. I think. By the way, another team that you can't watch. It's awfully good. Oklahoma City Thunder. We uh, you know, we touched on them a little bit with uh, the spanking they gave the the Nuggets. Just random observation here, but I've I've got them on the phone below the uh, computer screen here, watching them play the the Hawks. Casey Wallace just picked Trey Young's pocket twice, two different possessions, out of you know near half court. You don't see that very often, especially by a second year guy who's probably their third best perimeter defender. That is a terrifyingly good defensive team. Yeah, they got a chance yeah. to be the best defensive team in the league this year, for sure, with the amount of versatility and depth they've got across the board. There's basically nobody they play that's a bad defender. I mean, probably the worst defender they have is, what, Isaiah Joe, I would guess. And, I mean, he at least gets in the way. But, I mean, every guy that's going to play heavy minutes for them is good to better. Yeah. You know, like you, well, you've made comments about Jay Gilles Alexander's all-defensive team votes last year, which I'm not disagreeing with. but even their best player is a good defensive player. Like, yeah. They, I mean, he they don't a, have he, any holes. Yeah. He's, he, I'm not saying it's a bad defender. I mean, he gets a ton of steals. He's very active. My point is this. He's usually got the, you know, fourth or fifth toughest assignment on the floor. Oh, no. You're, I was agreeing with you. I'm not saying your point was wrong. Yeah, I just I mean, like, usually it's, they don't have a guy, they have nobody to pick on. Right. Like, and they don't even have Isaiah Hart and any, Hart any play more, right now. Anymore. Right. The guy that, to pick on. They traded That's for true. arguably the best perimeter defender in the league, or one of. That's I, true. And Drew Holiday probably has that crown, but this, the, the, the Thunder top. game is not over yet. They've got a double digit lead, but uh, Shea is sniffing. Shea is on the edge of a thirty point triple double in this game. What? And, uh, what's and, Chet's uh, rebounding numbers? He because he, he's been rebounding he, like he a needs mad. two rebounds. He's he's on. Uh, Chet is on the edge of um of his third straight twenty ten game. He's he actually needs three rebounds. Uh, there's, he's got seven minutes to get three rebounds. I don't know if he'll get there, but um. Uh, he's on the edge of us. His third straight. He's came into this game averaging twenty three and fifteen over the first couple of games. Um, they're pretty good. He looked abs. He was absolutely unbelievable in the opener against the Nuggets. He was the best player on the court in that game. One that, of the other that reasons was pretty pretty scary for the league. One of the other reasons it was so impressive and also and continues to be impressive is that right now, I know there's been a lot of focus on. Um, how thin some other teams are at center, specifically the Knicks. Mm-hmm. Right now, the second, third, and fourth string centers for the uh, Thunder are injured. Um, obviously, Isaiah Hartenstein. Did we get that right? That Isaiah Hartenstein. That is the correct pronunciation. Um, uh, he is out with the hand injury. Uh, Jalen Williams, Jay Will, uh, is out with a hamstring injury. He's missed the whole preseason. And their four string center is Kendrick Williams, who had surgery on his knee back in um, in August. He's not an ideal center, but that's who they would play. Yeah. And so they've been playing Usman Jang uh, as their backup center. And so um, he's tall. He's like six, nine, but he's a wing. You know, he weighs a hundred and something pounds. So no, he's, he's a little sturdier than that. He's not he's not real thin, but he's a he's a he's listed at a hundred. Whatever he's pounds. listed at, it doesn't really matter. Really? The point is, he ain't he ain't a center. Yeah, he's no, a big he, wing, but he ain't a center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Chet has got to go out there with <laughs> no safety net, you know, basically behind him. So he's you know he's putting up these numbers. And you know, the the idea is that he's going to play more at power forward, where he can have a better matchup at some point too. Once this gets going, um, the night that Hartenstein um, hurt his hand, they had started. They actually started the two of them together. So. I, I'm still curious, and we'll, we'll have to wait a month or so to start finding out, but I am curious how much power forward Chet actually plays. Um, he'll he'll play know. some, but when they're, when, they're, when they're playing, their best lineups are with him at center for all the reasons that it was important last year that he came in playing center. And, you know, look, you saw him the other night. He's going up against Nikola Jokic, and the, the, the back and forth when he blocked Jokic at the rim, went down and absolutely oh. detonated at the rim. 
It's one of the best end to end sequences you're going to see all season. And look again, it's one week in. They're playing now, but he looks like he's got a chance to be an all star this year. Yeah. And if he can make that kind of leap this year and stay on the court and be better across the board, an already good team just got a lot better. Yeah, and one of the things that's already sort of starting to um, to show up is sort of the no stats all star type of uh, game that Alex Caruso is playing. Mm-hmm. Um, well, so, the opener, he was scoreless and plus 19 off the bench. <laughs> exactly. So for, as of this exact second, which <laughs> I mean, the game is still going on. He's plus 35 in, you know, 2.75 games so far this season. Um, and he's only scored, I think two baskets. Yeah. Well, and the biggest thing that they can do with him is just not play him very much. Like, which sound, which obviously, like you think, well, you get it, you trade for a guy like Alex Caruso who can be a closer in playoff games. It's like, well, he's going to play 30, 35 minutes a game. We all know Caruso, the way Caruso plays and at his age and with his injury history, he's a guy who tends to only be available a certain amount of the time. If they can basically have him go out there for 20 minutes a game and just wreck things, that that's just, that's just a massive advantage to just be able to have a weapon like that you could put out there whenever you need to. Yeah. And and with Chet, they can they can trim Chet's minutes, which we'll see. You know, that's why I say we'll see how much that he actually plays with Hartenstein. It's interesting he played so well against Joker because that's like one of the very short list of bigs that they had in mind when hey, we need a guy like Hartenstein. Um, but you know, last year, rookie year, played all 82. I think he did wear down late in the year. You saw it. It's funny. He admits that. He admits that. Yeah. Yeah, and the one thing he hadn't done this year is shot the three wheel, but you saw it in his three point shooting numbers late last season. No, he's three uh, of five tonight. There you go. But it's uh, it's interesting though because you know a guy like that not not that he I'm not saying he's selfish, but naturally a guys that talented that young they're seeking to establish themselves or you know making an all star game matter stuff like that. So trimming a guy's minutes can be tough. You know, it's it's like yeah. Uh, it's a different level of stardom, but like the Mavericks with Luca, yeah, you want to manage the guy's minutes, but he wants to lead the league in score and he wants to win the MVP. So, you know, th- those conversations aren't always just about, uh, you know, the sports science side of things. I want to know what my one of my favorite uh, notes slash stats about uh, Chet is? He's the first Chet in the NBA since 1975. Who's the last Chet? It's Chet Walker. Chet Walker. Oh, all right. Pretty good couple of players. But there was a bunch of Chets in like the you know the forties, fifties, and sixties. You know, Chet was more of a name. You know? <laughs> He's bringing Chet back. <laughs> there you go. It's pretty you know? him and Chet Walker. Pretty good couple of players. That ain't too bad. Yeah. So, uh, all right. Well, McMahon's got to be ready to go. I'm actually. I didn't know you were going to Minnesota, McMahon. I'm kind of excited about what you're going to pull back from there. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to uh, you know looking forward to spending a few days around the wolves, and this is a good time of year to go to Minnesota. I think it's not like <laughs> negative twelve at this point, so yeah. you're right about that. You're right about that. Uh, all right, Bond Temps have a safe trip to Boston, and uh, Jackson, thanks for taking care of us. Thank you for watching, listening to the Hoop Collective. We'll be back with you on Wednesday. Adios, amigos. <laughs>